been a full day of work and I uh, drove three hours up to Houston so that I could enjoy the very last few hours of the Friday auction at Bear Jackson. Arr! I'm already I'm already very happy about my decision. I'm gonna have a beer. I'm gonna walk around and as you know I'm just gonna put some snippets of little factoids on any car that I come across that I find interesting you know you know the drill but oh I'm already so excited I like bright lights and I like shiny cars ah! all right let me find the bar and let's do it so I actually had eyeballed this 1930 Model A on the website you know I like to look at the dockets before it comes so I can see what I and it's just one thing that I haven't actually done as much research into is I would like is the popularity of paint colors. This is not the first 30s like vehicle that I've seen that enjoys this kind of like lime avocado green color. You know, I remember I was at uh, an Amelia Island, I think it was the RM Sotheby's auction back in like 2013 and I saw a Willis that had this like crazy pinstriping green color and I was like, oh, that is just unique. Was this avocado green popular in the 30s. I will go home and research that. So very happy with the beer and the cars. My fair lady. Another one I was eyeballing was this 280ZX. I love the Z. The Z is awesome. And the 20... 22Z looks pretty rad. We have a manual option, which thank God that's not dying out for true drivers. And the thing about the Z, so Miss, all right, I'm not gonna get that much into the history, but I'm gonna do a little bit. Now, Mr. K was uh, kind of the red-headed red -headed stepchild of Nissan. And he knew that there was a market in America for a sports car, all right? He went to them, he's like, hey, we need to make this, blah, blah, blah. They said, sure, but you need to put it under the Dodson name because we're scared of failure. But little did they know that it would become one of the most beloved sports cars of all time. Oh my God, it's my baby. Oh my God, I have goosebumps right now, guys. I have goosebumps. My very first car was a 300D. A diesel behemoth, but oh my god, the seats were amazing. Look, you can see, I'm gonna turn the, look at that. I mean, it was like I was driving. Oh my god, oh, I'm, I am getting nostalgic right here. <gasps> this is too much, seriously. And this was a tank. My dad, who was a mechanic, knew what he was doing, putting his, let's say, attention-challenged 16-year-old daughter and a Mercedes diesel. This thing, oh, kept on going. <laughs> I did at one point have an ignition issue, all right? So I would, with the diesel engines on the Mercedes, you actually had a stop engine button on the engine. And so every time I had to stop the car, I had to lift the hood and press the stop button in, engine button. Stop button, yeah, you know what I'm saying. It's hard to talk when somebody else is talking right behind me. It's kind of confusing. Also, not only did I have to raise the hood to stop the engine, I had to raise the hood to start it because I also had alternator issues. And in that glove box at the center console, really, I kept a tiny little hammer to bang the alternator with anytime I needed to start it. You know, they say that the cobbler's son has no shoes. Well, the mechanic's daughter has a lot of character, I guess. <laughs> you have to have no heart if you don't love a Chevelle, an SS Chevelle. Powered by a V8 and uh, really, really pretty. Got a piece of American automotive history right behind me. AMC Rambler. Ooh. I need to devote like an entire show behind AMC. Lot to talk about. Shoot, we knew I was gonna talk about the Ranchero. I love the Ford Ranchero. I also like. I'm more into the first generation, but I also love like later generations. It's just so fun and retro. 
And Ford was actually, even though everybody knows about the El Camino more, it feels like, or modern public, you know what I mean? Uh, the Ranchero came out two years before, but Chevy wasn't going to let that sales, they weren't going to let that market opportunity go to waste, and they hopped in with the El Camino. God, this Lincoln is glorious. <laughs> I don't know what just did that. That's exciting. Oh. Anyways, 1930 Lincoln, beautiful. The story behind Lincoln, well, Henry Leland, an overall badass in automotive history. He had just, he had already gotten in and out of starter, starting Cadillac. And then him and his son went off to start Lincoln, and they did that with some kind of like government loan to actually begin working on airplane engines. But, I don't want to get in this guy's photo right here, but, but Henry Leland started Lincoln, started Cadillac, the man behind two of America's most competitive luxury automotive manufacturers. I love it. Also, so when he did, um, I don't remember the, if it was like he went defunct or lost, got bankrupt, I don't know, whatever. But Henry Ford came after Lincoln, wanted to purchase it. He was still furious about the creation of Cadillac. Now, how Cadillac actually got created was some um, board directors of one of Ford's early ventures was like, Henry, we need you to go and liquidate this Ford, this plant that Ford had started because you know Ford Henry Ford had like 15 different ventures before he actually succeeded with the Ford company yeah a long story but Henry Leland was sent to liquidate that and he said hey instead of liquidating this place let me start Cadillac <laughs> and so forever after that Henry Ford hated Henry Leland and when Leland had to sell Lincoln Henry Ford offered him this most absurd dollar amount, like something super silly, but ended up getting Lincoln, and now Lincoln is kind of the, the flagship of Ford, so the more you know. extra money anywhere I buy it oh. first gen Mustang you know I was gonna stop and talk about this <sighs> let me get a deep breath because here it goes and let me take a little sip oh, I'm enjoying myself too much all right first gen Mustang the brainchild from Lee Iacocca Lee realized there were about to be a lot of baby boomers on the way that would want a stylish, cheap, reliable, and fuel efficient vehicle. And he made the Mustang, yes. This is a weird story, all right, but that's okay. Because I love it, it's kind of weird, but okay. Anyways, the gentleman that carved this, carved the original Mustang, carved this Mustang emblem that we see everywhere, was one of the, and I wish I remembered his name right now, but you know, this little noggin can't hold on to everything, nor should it was the la one of the last men to lead a cavalry charge. Yes, cavalry charge, men on horses going into battle. So funny, so cool. Now also, interesting little fact, since, since we're already talking about the emblem. So imagine this, there is a boardroom full of Ford executives, you know, and this is it during that time. This is like what, late 50s? early 60s. Actually, it's the early 60s because I think they only had like three years to get the Mustang out. I don't know if I remember that properly. Now, back to the back to the picture I was painting. You have a boardroom full of Ford executives and they are all arguing about which direction the Ford Mustang, the Mustang, should face. Okay? Well, Naturally, when they think of horses, they're thinking about the derby ring and the direction that they go in the derby ring, and they're like, no, 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 that's how it should go. 
and Lee Iacocca, like the badass he is, and was, actually was, I'm sorry, um, says, and so Iacocca says, stands up and says, the Mustang is not a domesticated beast. It will go in the opposite direction. It's not the exact quote, but you know, you can't expect me to remember all the quotes, but it's, you get the gist. Mustangs, the 350, and uh, it was basically a guaranteed ticket. Oh, you already see what I'm going after. I couldn't help it. I literally just went oh, in the middle of an inner of like a little area for the Isetta over here. If you watch my videos, then you know I stop off and pop off about the Isetta all the time. The Isetta was uh, so attractive to BMW to purchase the license off of ESO Spa because post-World War, what, two Germany? Well, most German citizens were only able to drive motorcycle licenses. And you could drive the Isetta with a motorcycle license. I get nervous talking in front of people. But anyways, I'll we'll continue. That's why BMW bought the license from Iso Spa. Literally, my cat is named for Renzo Revolta, who owned Iso Spa. Prior to it being Iso Spa that shot out vehicles, the Isetta and then the Iso Revolta and the Iso Grifo, um, they were Iso Thermos, which you can see a little bit of similarities in the entrance store, right? So the Isetta 300 has like 12 and a half, maybe 13 horsepower, and uh, it's a joy to drive. It's one of my favorite cars. The Isetta is one of my favorite cars. It's sold. I'm, I looked at the docket, but I was like, Kaylin, you bought yourself a car in February. You don't need to buy another one. But this is really easy to store. Like, this is considered decoration. You can put this in your house. So anyway, soon, right? Soon. I love this car. And you're welcome, because I could have talked about this for 15 minutes, but I haven't even made it like a quarter of the way through the action. Let's continue on. The shark! Yes, the car, the Porsche. Yes, I know it's pronounced Porsche, but I've been saying Porsche since I was eight years old. I'm from South Texas, so it's like a... The Porsche that broke all of the Porsche head fanatics, little minds, their little noggins would kaput. They popped out this. First of all, the engine wasn't where they all expected it to be. It was wa water cooled and uh, it blew folks' mind, but it was so innovative. Like, this was a, the Porsche that, the, their grand touring vehicle, all right? And when this came out, it was, I would say, frankly, it was underrated. Now everybody's getting it, all right? The values in the 928s have popped up substantially, also known as the Shark. They're a fun drive, and they are, uh, they're good cars. And also, I think they were the most expensive Porsche Porsche had ever put out at the time. are cool. 
So that was a Kaiser Manhattan. I remember the first Kaiser I saw in person was a Kaiser Darren at like the 2012 Amelia Island uh, Concourse Arms said to be something or other. You know, it has that cool kind of closet door. Um, and then the second one I saw in person was some random museum I went to in Salt Lake City. I appreciate that guy for just letting me into his warehouse to run around and I found a Kaiser. The very, it was like, it was a Kaiser Dragon if I remember that properly. So cool. But the cool thing also about Kaiser is like, you could literally, I had, could spend a whole show, radio show talking about it, but the man behind Kaiser was is also Kaiser Permanente, is Henry Kaiser, if I'm remembering his first name right. Henry Kaiser, all right? Not only, like, he, Renaissance man. He made cars, he made um, tankers, like war tankers, if I'm if I, yeah. Yeah, battleships, war tankers, and he also was a good employer to where he created, like, group health insurance. Pretty special. automotive manufacturers were sanctioned that they could not be working on any new vehicles with their in-house design team but you know who had an out-of-house design team Studebaker Ta -da! so kind of cool special you know this break is brought to you by white walls so this is the Auburn recreation that I saw on the docket, right? Yep. Auburn Speedster rec recreation. I'll take a recreation. Shoot. Beautiful. The boat tail. <laughs> oh, really, these, uh, the Auburn uh, boat tail, the cord, the Duesenberg, these are the cars that make me kind of want to cry. Like, I want to just want to like squeeze something a little bit hard. So beautiful! It really is. It's impressive that they've, I mean, this freaking looks just like a real Auburn. Now, how Auburn, Cord, and Duesenberg are all tied together? Well, they were all owned by a very clever gentleman, E.L. Cord. Yes. And they were kind of like the early, some early American badass automotive manufacturers. And it's very sad that we don't have them anymore today. So, anyways, very cool. Love this kind of brown, like brown bronze. Okay, I know how that goes. Like, 
sometimes pieces of hood ornaments disappear. And if you're one of those people that ever take them, I swear, God, I'm gonna find you. Anyways, Pierce Arrow, funny fact, all right? Now, how they got their start, which literally every automotive manufacturer in the early stages of car game didn't start off where you would think sometimes. You know, some of them were like bikes, motorcycles, and then cars, sewing machines, and then cars, you know? Pierce Arrow, Victorian bird cages. How about that, sports fan? It's like one of my favorite facts. I read that on a plaque at the Revs Institute in Naples, Florida. Amazing museum you should get there. Now, Pierce Arrow also was one of the three P's of early American luxury. That's right. If you wanted luxury in, uh, <laughs> that came out of America, you were gonna get a Pierce Arrow, a Packard, or a Peerless. It's pretty special. Let's take more looks. gonna stop at the Citroen because you know I love Citroen all right I love the history I love Andre Citroen the founder of Citroen who is a badass guy he treated all his employees really well now how he had his start actually was as a gears manufacturer and so he created Chevron shaped gears and that is how you see ah, the Chevron logo for his gears that he also was in ammunition and a variety of other things the DS is neat because it actually saved one of France. It was it, which one of France? President or or dignitary saved them during an assassination. So good to know. literally did the inverse of Lamborghini. Porsche already, it was, this is a 1960 tra uh, tractor. 1948 is when the 356 came out, all right? They were already in their A game. They were five years away, I think, from putting the 911 out. And they're all, you know what we're gonna do? Uh, we're gonna try out some uh, farming equipment. I love that. Now why that's the, hi there. Why that's the inverse of Lamborghini. Lamborghini started off, Ferruccio Lamborghini started off by making tractors, all right? And then he got pissed off at Enzo Ferrari and was like, you know what, I can do this better than you can. And he started making grand touring sports cars, etc. Ah, uh, that's funny. And I love this. Like, I love this. The first time, the first Porsche tractor I've seen. I need to get out of this habit of telling y'all the first time I saw some, but it uh, clearly excites me. But uh, the first Porsche tractor I saw was when I went to the museum in Stuttgart, and it was pretty special. But I just think that's funny. That's pretty 
freaking cool. Now, Rickenbacker was founded in 1921, and basically it was a couple of guys that had already been in the automotive game for a while, and they said, you know what? Let's make another car company, and let's use the name. Let's be inspired by Eddie Rickenbacker, which was like the famous World War I fighter pilot, and they use their his like squadrons insignia. What is it? Hat in the ring? Yeah. ring for the Umbro. So this is a 1925 what pickup special? Yeah. Um, I'm assuming they did not make it past the Great Depression which took out a lot of early American automotive manufacturers but oh it's kind of cool. I don't get a lot of firsts you know what I mean. I've gone to so many car museums and so many auctions and shows that it's like it's really fun. It's, an ex it's like, I mean, everything's exciting, obviously. You can tell that's my, that, uh, whoop. you can tell. But it is very exciting when you see a first. into there. This is funny though, the, the mafiosa, the uh, mobsters figured this out, but slow, eventually, I, don't, I shouldn't say slowly, but eventually also police officers. So the Mark II would then become quite popular uh, with police as a police enforcement vehicle, which makes sense. If you're chasing a Mark II and you're not catching them, maybe you'll catch them with another Mark II. They're really beautiful cars. I wonder what, this is a 3.8 liter. Um, we have a Mark II coming to the shop quite a few times. Get to drive it, the owner's really cool. We got the best customers. What else do we got? Oh, look at that Chrysler. Beautiful. Oh, it's continental. It's continental. Behemoth, back when parking spaces were comfort lanes, right? These are big cars. Beautiful. I 
saw a VW bug that I want to take a look at. Let's go. Correction. All right, so this has one that actually has had an XJ6 engine put into it, which is a 4.2 liter straight six. Now, on the 3.8 liter engine, if I remember prep, and I think I do remember this properly, this was, the engine that was in this was also the engine that originally debuted in the XK120. <laughs> I'm so excited I can't even talk. It's also the engine that debuted in the XK120, which is my, my everything for the most part. Uh, the XK120 engine was the engine that William Lyons worked on all during World War II and he wanted to debut it and he just popped out a very lustful body and that was the 120 it wasn't supposed to be a thing but the 120 engine like that straight six engine was actually used for a long time like almost into the 80s I think if I remember that properly you thought I was gonna talk about the Mustang didn't you not gonna do it mm. so let's talk a little bit about the people's car now the funny thing about this is um, you know when the Allied forces went into Germany and they found the people's car manufacturing plant well first they tried to uh, they tried to auction off the, the what is it the dies jigs dies they tried to auction off a lot of the equipment that went into this. Nobody wanted it. Nobody wanted it. And little did they know that it would end up being one of the most beloved vehicles of the 60s. How about that sports fan? Deaf people's car. Okay. My friends, I hope you had a very good time. Obviously I did. <laughs> this is my cup of tea. Walking around with beer checking out cars, sharing factoids, seeing other people purchase their cars. Dude, the Porsche tractor went for 30 grand. Like, I feel like I would have bought that. I mean, I don't have 30 grand to spend on a tractor. <laughs> on a tractor. But, I mean, tempted. You know what I mean? So, anyways, got distracted on that. So, I've made a couple of videos about the Willis Jeepster, but this is the first time I've seen a Willis wagon. I think this has been sold, and I think that guy just hopped in there regardless, but I don't know. I don't roll, I don't run this place. Uh, this is cool. Now, with the Jeepster, and this is more refined, because initially, so Willis was very utilitarian, and with the Jeepster, that was their first attempt at kind of uh, getting a little style and grace into society, and not just being utilitarian, right, shall I say? And I've always been kind of like intrigued and in, in love with the grills. You know what I mean? These kind of like triangular grills. They're beautiful. Like I said, that guy just hopped in here, but he didn't buy it. I'm very particular on vehicle etiquette. Mm. Just touching things in there. It drives me crazy. Anyways, beautiful. I thought I was leaving, but I'm not. I keep seeing things I didn't see. Like that Willis wagon and then this 57 Ford Ranchero, which was the first year for Rancheros to pump out, okay? Um, it's funny because the first gen, you had the 57, the 58, and 59, and they each had a different grill. And I said that I loved the 59 grill, but the 57 ain't bad. Either way, I love this retro look. Ugh. And, um, as I had said when I saw like the 70s Ranchero over there, well, Ford was the first to pop onto the scene with this oot utility vehicle. Not a truck, not a car. And oh my God, I want one so bad. Is it sold yet? I don't need to, I don't need to buy anything. I don't need to buy anything. It did 40, basically 39.5, 40K. Not bad. I love it. Well, I thought I was leaving, but then I ran into Little Red. Yeah. So this is Mr. Jackson, Craig Jackson of Barrett Jackson's GT500. Yes, the first of two 
of Shelby's experimental GT500s, along with um, the Green Hornet. And they were lost. This was lost in a field in Texas, and then he found it and spent millions to make it perfect. And that he did. It's pretty special, <laughs> to say the least. Let's say you're not used to this channel or just happened upon it. Well, this is kind of how it goes. I share interesting little history tidbits about vehicles because I like them. Grew up in a mechanic shop. We specialized in foreign and antique automotives, shook enterprises. As I always say, the best thing that ever happened to me was uh, being born a mechanic's daughter and having the passion of cars continue on. And if that's your cup of tea, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. Cheers. <laughs>